Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's annual open meeting. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the webinar, which will be addressed at the Q&A session of the webinar. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. Please note all audio connections are muted at this time. If you require technical assistance, please send the chat to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the meeting over to David Ferrier. David, please go ahead. Good morning and welcome to the National Archives, literally the National Archives. I'm talking to you from 700 Pennsylvania Avenue. Thank you for joining us for our fourth annual meeting of the Office of Government Information Services, the Federal Freedom of Information Act Ombudsman. And July is a most appropriate month for OGIS's annual meeting. 54 years ago this month, President Lyndon Baines Johnson signed FOIA into law, providing for the public availability of federal department and agency records. In the years since, Congress has amended FOIA, creating OGIS in 2007, the office opened in 2009, and in 2016, mandating that OGIS had an annual meeting to inform the public about its reviews and reports and to receive public comments. When President Johnson signed FOIA into law in 1966, he noted in his signing statement that he did so, quote, with a deep sense of pride that the United States is an open society in which the people's right to know is cherished and guarded, unquote. As the 10th Archivist of the United States, I share that profound pride in our open society, and I'm proud of the work that OGIS does advocating for a federal FOIA process that works for all. OGIS's work facilitating greater access and transparency to federal government records and assisting anyone who seeks help with the FOIA process ties closely to our democracy. OGIS's work also fits squarely into one of the National Archives' four strategic goals, make access happen. Later this morning, we'll hear from two members of the FOIA Advisory Committee about the 22 recommendations the committee has sent to me for improving the FOIA process. The committee, whose 20 members I appointed two years ago, has spent the last two years researching, surveying, listening, and deliberating to come up with new ways to improve FOIA. The recommendations, which the committee approved last month and were delivered to me earlier this month, provide a roadmap for some of the work OGIS will do in the next year. Before turning the program over to OGIS Director Alina Simo for an update on OGIS's activities in the last year, a note to the FOIA community. Thank you for the work you do, whether you are a member of the public submitting FOIA requests for records or a member of the Federal Civil Service or a contractor working to fulfill those requests. None of this is easy amidst the pandemic and racial injustice, but your work, as President Johnson noticed, helps our democracy work. Thank you. Over to you, Alina, to update us on OGIS's activities for the past year. Great. Thank you so much, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Alina Simo, Director of the Office of Government Information Services, or OGIS. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our fourth annual open meeting and our first virtual one. I hope everyone who is joining us today has been staying safe, healthy, and well. Um, and again, thank you for joining us virtually. We are very pleased uh, that Congress has given us the opportunity to provide an update um, on the review and reports of our office and to allow interested persons to appear and present oral and written statements. This is a perfect forum to showcase all the great work that OGIS has been doing this past year and briefly cover our activities from the fall of 2019 to the present. We have reserved time at the end of today's session to receive public comments. We will also be monitoring the chat function and we will do our best to summarize any substantive comments we receive via chat during the public comment period. You may also submit any written comments to our email box, OGIS Open Meeting at nara.gov. 
Our annual report for fiscal year 2019 is unique in a couple of different ways. First, we debuted a new and improved and much shorter annual report, a total of 10 substantive pages, not including the chart at the end, but we still managed to highlight all of the important work that OGIS has accomplished. Second, this annual report represents a fiscal year that challenged OGIS in unexpected ways. OGIS began the year with budget constraints while NARA continued under a series of continuing resolutions and prevented us from filling some long pending vacancies. And following the longest shutdown in the history of the federal government, OGIS returned and hit the ground running on all fronts, with dispute resolution, compliance, and training and outreach. Let me cover each of these in more detail. Increase to OGIS continued at a pace roughly the same as the previous fiscal year. In fiscal year 2019, we handled and closed 4,649 requests for assistance from both FOIA requesters and the agencies. This represents a small decrease from the 4,681 requests for assistance we addressed in fiscal year 2018. But as you can see um, from uh, this chart, and we have discussed in the past, the increase in our caseload from the fourth quarter of fiscal year 2016 on is directly connected to the passage of the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016. The amendments reaffirm the critical role OGIS plays in the FOIA process by requiring agencies to advise requesters of OGIS services at any stage throughout the FOIA administrative process. As in previous years, the majority of those who requested our assistance were individuals seeking help uh, with the FOIA process. Despite the challenges of, of this past year, we streamlined our dispute resolution process and decreased our backlog by 50%. In fiscal year 2019, we look closely at the information we share with requesters to ensure that we are providing information that not only assists with the disputes at hand, but may improve future FOIA requests. We encourage requesters, whenever possible, to seek assistance directly from the agency in question. For instance, requesting an estimated date of completion using the agency's resources before asking OGIS to request a date on their behalf. FOIA requires us to report on the number of times each agency engaged in dispute resolution with the assistance of OGIS or the FOIA public liaison. And we have included this graphic to show those agencies with which we have interacted the most frequently in fiscal year 2019. Do not believe these statistics have changed. Um, Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, uh, Social Security Administration tend to be our, our most frequent customers and, uh, and clients. In the world of compliance, uh, the FOIA statute mandates that OGIS review FOIA policies, procedures, and compliance, and identify procedures and methods for improving compliance. We do that in a variety of ways, including assessing individual agency FOIA programs, conducting assessments on a broader scale, connecting with agencies through a self-assessment program, and leading and supporting the FOIA Advisory Committee. We reviewed and updated FOIA regulations from nine departments and agencies in fiscal year 2019, SIGI, FDA, NASA, Department of Interior, Committee for Purchase from People Who Are Blind or Severely Disabled, Commission of Fine Arts, Department of State, American Battle Monuments Commission, and EPA. We completed and published one issue assessment, leveraging technology and FOIA searches. And we worked with individual agencies on specific compliance issues that arose in the course of providing dispute resolution services. For a third consecutive year, we partnered with NAR colleagues who administer the annual Records Management Self-Assessment, RMSA. As part of its oversight of federal records management programs, NAR conducts the self-assessment to determine whether federal agencies are complying with statutory and regulatory records management requirements. The partnership with the Chief Records Officer has assisted us with expanding our review of agency FOIA policies and procedures, identifying potential compliance issues that merit further exploration, and setting OGIS's goals and priorities. We published our assessment of the Department of Education, our 13th assessment of an agency FOIA program since OGIS established its compliance program. OGIS recommended seven actions that the department should take to comply with the FOIA, 
including updating its FOIA regulations to reflect amendments to the FOIA, as well as the Department's processes for implementing substantive and procedural changes. The Department published its updated FOIA regulation early in fiscal year 2020. Our work with the FOIA Advisory Committee kept us fully engaged in a number of ways. The 2018-2020 term of the committee held four public meetings, a range of experts presented to the committee on such topics as inspector general audits of agency FOIA and records management programs, academic research on FOIA administration and trends, including how first party requests dominate from agency FOIA programs, and the use of technology in administering FOIA. In between full committee meetings, the committee's three subcommittees, records management, time volume, and vision, met and began drafting proposed recommendations to the archivist. More on this later today. We also monitored and reported on the progress of prior committee recommendations, and I am pleased to report that we are able to complete five of eight committee recommendations thus far, and two additional recommendations are currently in progress, and we anticipate being able to complete them by the end of this year. OGIS continued its outreach out its outreach efforts this past year, we organized another successful Sunshine Week program that featured a conversation between Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, and Chief Judge of the U.S. District Court of the District of Columbia, Farrell Howells. The event also included panel discussions on the past, present, and future of OGIS and the future of electronic record keeping. We hosted two public meetings of the Chief Boy Officers Council along with the DOJ Office of Information Policy during which we discussed important issues with FOIA professionals across the federal government. And OGA staff presented at a variety of organizations, including the American Society of Activist Professionals and the Coalition of Federal Ombudsmen, and a FOIA program sponsored by the Census Bureau and CDC. We were able to teach eight sessions of FOIA dispute resolution skills for FOIA professionals, seven agency specific and one interagency one. Unfortunately, our ability to offer these training courses have been significantly curtailed during the pandemic, but we are examining ways to retool our training for online offerings. In our two previous annual reports, we noted an increased demand for training tailored to the needs of individual agencies. This trend continued in fiscal year 2019 as we presented agency-specific training to the FDA, DHS, EPA, Department of Agriculture, DOD, and Department of the Treasury. And in November 2018, we also prevent, pr provided one interagency session. Despite the challenges we have all been facing during the COVID-19 pandemic, I am very proud to say that OGIS was able to adapt and transition smoothly within a matter of weeks to full-time telework. Since mid-March of this year, we have accomplished an amazing amount of work. We have received 1,238 new requests for mediation or ombuds assistance. We have closed 1,209 such requests. We have received and closed 403 telephone calls for mediation or ombuds assistance. We have co-hosted a roundtable discussion with OIP and co-chairs of Chief FOIA Officers Council Technology Committee to discuss technology issues with other government FOIA professionals. We have held two public FOIA Advisory Committee meetings. We have completed and published the FOIA Advisory Committee's final report and recommendations. We have hosted a successful webinar for CDC FOIA program to discuss their FOIA issues and constraints during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have published an assessment regarding how agencies are doing and informing requesters via their website about constraints or their FOIA processing capabilities during this time. As many of you know, the FOIA Advisory Committee, which reports to the Archivist of the United States, provides a forum for public discussion of FOIA issues and offers members of the public the opportunity to provide feedback and ideas for improving the FOIA process. The Archivist has renewed the committee's charter for fourth term, 2020 to 2022, and I am excited to continue to chair the next committee term. We were pleased to receive a number of nominations, which the archivist will review, and we will announce the new committee members before our first meeting of the next term, which is scheduled for Thursday, September 10th. Today, we are excited to be able to discuss the work of the third term of the FOIA Advisory Committee, 
and their recently issued final report and recommendation. We have a distinguished uh, panel today, and I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator of this panel, Kirsten Mitchell, and she in turn will introduce our panelists. Kirsten wears many hats, including as the compliance team lead with OGIS. She began her work at OGIS as a facilitator and has helped to resolve disputes between FOIA requesters and federal agencies in hundreds of cases. Kirsten is also serving as the president of the American Society of Access Professionals, an organization that brings FOIA professionals and the requester community together to collaboratively improve access to information and privacy processes. Before joining OGIS in 2010, she worked at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and the Sunshine Government and Government Initiative, a coalition of media groups that worked to gain passage of the Open Government Act of 2007, which amended FOIA and created OGIS. As a former journalist, Kirsten uh, frequently used state and federal records requests to shine a light on how government operates, most recently with the New York Times Company. Kirsten earned her undergraduate degree in English from Mary Washington College and her graduate degree in journalism and public affairs from American University. But the most important hat for today's purposes that Kirsten has worn oh so gallantly for the last two years has been as a designated federal officer for the FOIA Advisory Committee. So you may ask, what does the designated federal officer or DFO do? Beyond the core duties required by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, the DFO assures that accurate records are kept to the committee's deliberations and minutes of meetings are prepared and certified, sends agendas and copies of all related information to members before meetings, makes logistical arrangements for the meetings and arranges for resource persons, guest speakers, and supplementary materials, prepares federal register notices, maintains all committee documents, attends all subcommittee meetings, and this is my favorite one, sits next to the chair for communication during meetings and make sure that committee business is conducted according to all applicable regulations, policies, and procedures. So she keeps me on track. I definitely could not have succeeded as the chair of the committee without Kirsten's amazing support and organizational skills. Um, she has helped bring to the finish line what we will be discussing next. So without uh, further ado, Kirsten, I'm going to turn it over to you. and uh, and have you take over the slides. Okay, thank you, Alina. That was a lovely introduction. Um, and I just wanna say I don't do this alone. I have lots of help here at the National Archives for all of these various jobs. Um, so I will introduce our panelists. Jason Barron really needs no introduction, but a few words. He has had a long and distinguished career as an expert in electronic record keeping and e-discovery for which he is nationally and indeed internationally known. He's currently with the firm Fagri Drinker. He was the first appointed director of litigation for the National Archives and Records Administration for 13 years. Prior to that, he was a trial lawyer and senior counsel at the U.S. Department of Justice where he acted as lead counsel on a number of FOIA lawsuits. Jason has been quoted in many publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. He has been invited to appear on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, and Good Morning America. And it is a good morning indeed when the FOIA world can hear from Jason Barron. Patricia West, has had a long and distinguished career at five federal agencies, most re recently as Deputy Assistant General Counsel in the FOIA branch of the National Labor Relations Board. She has also worked at three cabinet level agencies, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Department of Energy, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, as well as the Export-Import Bank. Um, I love the, the wide variety of experience that um, Patricia brings. Um, Patricia is a big believer in collaboration and in picking up the phone to talk with requesters. Um, one of my favorite stories about Patricia is she once greatly exceeded a requester's expectations when she phoned him to seek clarification on his FOIA request and explain types of agency 
records. Um, he was a bit um, surprised that he got a call from a government official, and this call happened years ago, but to this day, Patricia often thinks of this gentleman whenever she phones requesters. Uh, Jason and Patricia were both on the final report working group that compiled and wrote the final report from various subcommittee reports, which um, we'll hear more about in a, in a little bit. I want to also recognize Abby Mosheim of the Consumer Product Safety Commission and Sean Moulton of the Project on Government Oversight, who worked with Jason and Patricia in getting this final report um, to print, if you will. So before launching into the 22 recommendations, I just want to give some real quick background on the FOIA Advisory Committee. So um, as Alina mentioned earlier, the archivist signed the charter for the upcoming FOIA Advisory Committee um, earlier, or a few weeks ago. Um, it's very much like the previous charter. Balance is very, very important. Um, there are no more than 20 individuals from inside and outside of government, and they are tasked with studying the federal FOIA landscape across the executive branch and making recommendations to archivist David Ferriero. Much more about the committee is available on the FOIA website, and the link is here on the slides. So this term um, of the Federal FOIA Advisory Committee decided in 2018 to form three subcommittees devoted to records management, time and volume issues, and a vision subcommittee looking at the future of FOIA. So before turning it over, I will um, give you a quick overview of each of the, the committees. Um, each subcommittee, as I mentioned earlier, submitted a report, which is available on the FOIA Advisory Committee website. The recommendations from the three subcommittees were in turn merged into the single set of recommendations. Each subcommittee had two co-chairs, one from inside the government and one from outside the government. So I want to quickly mention um, the, the members who were the co-chairs. For time and volume, uh, Emily Creighton of the American Immigration Council um, was the non-government co-chair, and Bradley White of the Department of Homeland Security was the, the um, government co-chair. What's interesting about the American Immigration Council is there is no court discovery in immigration proceedings, so FOIA is the tool that one uses to get information from the government, so very big, big user of FOIA. Um, the Department of Homeland Security, where Bradley White hails from, in FY 2019 processed nearly 430,000 FOIA requests, or 49% of all FOIA requests processed that fiscal year. So the Vision Subcommittee chairpersons were Joan Kaminer of the Environmental Protection Agency and Chris Knox of Deloitte. Um, EPA processed more than 9,500 requests in FY 2019, so much smaller than DHS, but, but still a um, big force in FOIA. And Deloitte is a government contractor with, um, does a lot of work with FOIA discovery. And then finally, records management. Um, Jason Barron, as I introduced earlier with Fagri Drinker, partnered with Ryan Law at the Department of the Treasury. Um, Ryan is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Privacy, Transparency, and Records, so he wears many hats, overseeing both FOIA and records management, which, as you'll hear from Jason, is, is an important partnership. Um, let's start with records management, since nine of the 22 recommendations fall into records management. Jason, 
You and Ryan chaired the records management subcommittee. Can you give a brief overview of those recommendations and put them into perspective? Why are they important? Uh, thanks, Kirsten, and uh, thank you, Alina and Kirsten, for having me as part of this uh, webinar. I, I just want to say at the very top that the 13 years that I spent at the National Archives were some of the happiest uh, years in my time in government working with uh, Archivist David Ferriero and with General Counsel Gary Stern and the people in uh, the General Counsel's office. So um, I had a mission coming into the FOIA Advisory Committee term to think about uh, the subject of records uh, more holistically, uh, not just um, to have a silo with FOIA and a silo with um, the Federal Records Act. And what I thought um, that the subcommittee should do is to think about recommendations that would bridge that gap. Um, because in my experience in 33 years of government, um, at the Justice Department and at NARA, um, FOIA people were over here and records officers were over here and the lawyers were in a third place. And uh, while they talk to each other sometimes, um, there are different languages and cultures that are uh, present. And so why not have recommendations that try to integrate that along with new technology and new concepts that are coming into the 21st century uh, across the board on FOIA and the Federal Records Act. So that's how I conceive and Ryan conceived the, uh, the Records Management Subcommittee. So we'll go to the next slide, Kirsten. And we'll just go into um, the, uh, the recommendations. Now the recommendations on these slides are all over the place where we just took uh, several of them and they're not in the order of the final report, but you, they're all part of the final report. The first uh, one that I wanna talk about, recommendation four, is that uh, we believe that there should be training um, about records management for FOIA officers. So whether it's OIP or uh, being conducted in some other place, if there's going to be a module for FOIA, if there's training for FOIA, there should be a module for records management embedded within uh, the FOIA training. Similarly, um, at the National Archives, there's lots of training on records management issues, but um, uh, perhaps there should be uh, uh, a bit of emphasis on um, uh, highlighting FOIA for those individuals that are part of records management throughout the government. And so uh, it seems to me that, you know, you have the definition of federal record, you have the definition of agency record, you have um, a lot in common with these communities um, and uh, clearly searches on record systems. So uh, it seems to me training was very important. And so we put that um, right up in the recommendations very near the beginning. All right, next, uh, next slide. Um, we also thought, um, uh, Ryan in particular and the rest of our subcommittee thought that we should uh, recommend that guidance be put up on uh, FOIA websites that are related to records management. FOIA websites uh, vary throughout uh, the government, different agencies do different things, but um, and some have record, some have references to record schedules and um, and um, uh, as part of their uh, their website. But why not recommend that this is more generally the case that um, agencies put up records management related materials uh, on their website so the public can um, have a roadmap of sorts. Now there are other ways that agencies put up uh, uh, guides to FOIA requesters, but it seemed to us that it would be useful and helpful to have records management related materials, particularly record schedules, but not uh, limited to that. All right, next slide. Um, so uh, we also um, looked at uh, how agencies are putting up uh, uh, FOIA documents that have been released in um, online. And while some agencies use some services like FOIAonline.gov, um, we thought that uh, a good recommendation would be uh, for agencies to work towards the goal of giving access to records in central repositories in standardized ways using standardized metadata, um, uh, in addition to providing access on agency websites. So OIP has issued 
um, guidance on metadata. And in the final report, we talk at some length about how agencies to, could accomplish this, including with pointers from FOIA.gov um, and increased use of other uh, repositories. So it's something for agencies to consider. Uh, it would help the public access to have these kind of repositories to go to. All right, next slide. So um, the idea of, of uh, FOIA should be uh, integrated, we thought, in what NARA's initiative is, which is known as FERMI, the Federal Electronic Records Modernization Initiative. And NARA was very um, willing to, um, to think about this and is thinking about this in terms of a use case uh, for access. And the FERMI is a, um, a, an approach that uh, will uh, ultimately result in a standardized, interoperable RM solution cross-government uh, using what are universal electronic records management requirements. And access falls within the six categories of FERMI, of FERMI um, under use. And in the spreadsheets and the materials that are on the FERMI website, uh, one can see uh, that, uh, that there should be some incorporation of access issues like FOIA. And so we are encouraging a use case for FOIA, and agencies will become more familiar with FERMI over time. All right, next uh, slide. We also heard from uh, various uh, members of inspectors general offices um, in one of our public meetings, and it did trigger a, uh, a thought in our minds that we would recommend that the chair of SIGI, which is the overarching body that uh, inspectors general um, uh, meet and discuss uh, policy issues and, and issues of oversight, that SIGI consider designating a cross-cutting project or making as a priority area the issue of how agencies provide FOIA access, um, in particularly to records in electronic or digital form. This is something that I think is very important. I think inspectors general play uh, can play a, 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 a prominent role in pushing agencies to um, consider uh, new and different ways of going about this and uh, to improve uh, what they do. And so some Inspector General supervision is um, is uh, a worthy goal, and so we are recommending that SIGI consider this, and we hope that um, they take action on it in the future. Okay, next slide. So, my um, as people who know me know that I've been pushing e-discovery, pushing um, issues with respect to technology for some time. Did so with the government. Um, and so we wanted to talk a little bit about here about recommendations that go to machine readability, to e-discovery, and to chief data officers as the um, new way of thinking about uh, data and information and governance. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so one of the uh, recommendations that we uh, came forward with was that um, FOIA, the FOIA documents released on FOIA websites whether they're central repositories or whether they're um, you know, on agency web pages, um, should be open, legible, machine readable, and machine actionable. So what does that mean? Well, certainly we all know what legible means, um, that the good copies that are not, um, that are, you know, that are easy to read uh, should be up. But with respect to the other terms, this can vary over a spectrum. For, uh, we have some agencies that we noted are still putting up PDFs uh, or TIFF images that uh, cannot be uh, read as text. They need to be OCR using optical character recognition, and that's a problem. But beyond that, there are new technologies to embrace, like XML or JSON or HTML or using .csv um, as a, uh, a way of uh, being able to download spreadsheets. So uh, the report goes into more detail on this, but it, it seemed to us that uh, there's an opportunity to make uh, the documents that are released more user-friendly, um, and so we're recommending this. Uh, next slide. We, uh, okay, so this is one of my favorites, Kirsten and Patricia. So as you both know that I've been on a soapbox for um, 
oh, uh, probably 15 years to have lawyers embrace e-discovery and now for a larger community to embrace e-discovery. When I and others on the subcommittee read the chief FOIA officer reports that, are, that go into OIP every year, what I found is that there is an embrace of some e-discovery tools in federal agencies, but um, there uh, could be more done in this area. And what the um, report recommends is that agencies give serious consideration to what in the private sector we're calling technology-assisted review or predictive coding. So in larger requests that involve tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of documents, um, it would be much more efficient for the FOIA process to incorporate what are these advanced search techniques. It's not for every FOIA request, obviously, but in the larger realm, in the more complex realm of requests, um, agencies should think about this, and they should think more generally about e-discovery tools anyway uh, with even more modest requests. And so we go on at length about that, and there is – um, an element of the discussion in the report about um, making sure that the tools are used for email and capstone repositories. Every agency that has signed up for capstone that volunteered to do capstone, and I think there are on the order of 200 of them, um, are having a universe of being preserved for seven years in most cases and permanently for senior executives. And so it becomes important over time if a lot of email is being preserved in a repository um, to be able to search it um, adequately. And so e-discovery tools will help, and there should be, I think, a more robust discussion in government about using them. So I'll get off my soapbox there and go on to the next recommendation. Um, so this is another favorite of mine, um, and it will come up in another forum later, but um, we are in an era where um, the Foundations of Evidence-Based Policymaking Act of 2019 has um, triggered a requirement that each agency appoint a chief data officer, um, which uh, is that person is going to, in turn, be part of a chief data officer council. Um, and the, uh, the council has met at least once so far uh, this year. The, uh, the importance of CDOs is that they're tasked through OMB guidance to think about uh, the data life cycle and the life cycle of information. And part of a um, working group at each agency, uh, data governance body that the CDO chairs, is, uh, is going to be a chief FOIA officer and others in senior officials who are talking about data um, that the uh, each agency has, and I think it's important, and the subcommittee thought it was important to recommend that in that discussion, um, particularly from the narrow liaison, but from others, uh, to uh, enhance the discussion by bringing in considerations of FOIA and record keeping when you're discussing data. I can tell you that this is another uh, aspect of siloing where if we don't have that conversation with each agency, the risk is, is that CDOs and people in that community are not going to be thinking about FOIA and record keeping very much when they're looking at data quality and, and uh, the types of data that agencies have. But um, it's clear to me and to the subcommittee that there really is a very close connection here. Um, and so we recommended that um, that there is an interaction and, uh, and a teaching moment for the larger CDO community about records. Uh, next slide. So that's it uh, from me, and I'll turn it back to Pearson. Okay, thank you, Jason, for that um, brief overview. So before turning it over to Patricia, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, I heard you say a couple of times you had 
a few that you really liked a lot, but which one of all of these is your favorite recommendation of these that you have just presented? It's sort of like, uh, who's my favorite child? Well, I actually have one Exactly. Child, so easy for me. <laughs> uh, the, um, I, look, I've already said it, that e-discovery has been something that I have been focusing on for a very large part of my career because, um, frankly, when I was at the National Archives, we had the tobacco lawsuit, and I was tasked to uh, search through, you know, 30 million Clinton administration emails. And the situation's only gotten bigger. National Archives has hundreds of millions of emails uh, to search through and agencies as well through capstone repositories. And just because uh, every agency is keeping a lot of electronic stuff um, that in all sorts of forms, um, it is incumbent, it is absolutely important to search. You can't accumulate records without being able to search them. What's the purpose? Uh, the strategic goal is, uh, the archivist mentioned, is make access happen. You need to, you need to have some means of accessing uh, these incredibly large repositories. And so that's why I've been pushing uh, the tools that lawyers have developed um, in the discovery space uh, to uh, both records officers and FOIA officers. Okay, let me ask you one other question, and that is what ideas do you have for getting this implemented um, for the FOIA officer? At, at any federal agency, what what guidelines should he or she use? And so, well, across these recommendations, and in fact, across all of the recommendations, the ones that Patricia is going to discuss as well, and we're going to come back to, um, there is um, obviously a need for those experts in FOIA to be talking to others at the agency. The silo concept's got to go, but FOIA officers, uh, if they're not designated themselves as the chief FOIA officer at an agency, uh, report up to that chief FOIA officer. And that officer sits with other senior officials in what I call the C-suite, but, you know, CIOs, CFOs, uh, general counsels, uh, CISOs, and you name it, and uh, chief privacy officers. So there needs to be a conversation, which uh, we call information governance, a larger conversation that includes the FOIA professionals on staff. And if you can get a champion to hear you um, in across the board the, the kind of projects um, that a FOIA office wants to engage in, um, then you're, you know, you're uh, a lot of the way there. Uh, you obviously want to have small wins in the FOIA area before you uh, ask for huge amounts of money, expenditures in a budget. Um, and there isn't a whole lot of money in the government to do very much of uh, a lot of things. But, um, but I think the FOIA officer should be talking to others and not just uh, thinking of her job or his job as simply um, isolated and talking to only key individuals on FOIA requests. Okay, great. So excellent advice, forming partnerships and communicating. Um, Patricia, I am going to turn this over to you to go over the recommendations from uh, the Time Volume Subcommittee. And I understand that the subcommittees that you were on conducted surveys of FOIA officers and FOIA requesters. So we'd love to hear a bit about that as you go through the recommendations. Sure, uh, sure yeah, just to, um, well, first I want to say um, uh, when we put this presentation together, we did decide to give um, everyone the recommendations broken down by the subcommittee. So uh, when you see these different numbers, like one and 10 and five all over the place, just like you know, in the uh, report itself, it's, it's, it's organized um, and we've broken it out in the report by who the recommendations would go to if they were to OGIS or OIP, uh, the agencies or to the chief 
uh, FOIA officers, counsel, or to Congress. Um, so as Kirsten mentioned, uh, the time volume subcommittee did have a survey, uh, put together a survey, specific questions for requesters and specific requests for uh, federal FOIA professionals. Um, and the survey was sent out to different networks of the subcommittee members, as well as a uh, big thank you to Claire Shamley and the American Society of Access Professionals. Uh, they were very helpful to they went out to their network. Um, and as I said, the, the surveys were specifically drafted for one for FOIA professionals and one for requesters. And the decision among the committee members was to write open-ended questions because they really wanted to hear the voices of the, the folks who responded to the survey and not be limited by multiple choices. Uh, so the results of the surveys are attached to the subcommittee's report. And in it, it does have the responses broken down by percentages, but also there's a nice word cloud in there so you can uh, see some of the different language um, that, that came through. Um, what I found interesting in the survey was um, one of the, the questions for the requesters was, what is your biggest question about the FOIA process? And, and for all of them, their biggest question was, what is the process? Um, and then the flip side of that question, the FOIA agency professionals were asked, what do you think is the biggest area of confusion among requesters? And they identified it as knowledge about the process. Um, it's interesting because a lot of times the responses from the FOIA professionals and from the requester community almost mirrored each other. Um, for example, we had some questions in there regarding uh, training for FOIA professionals. And the FOIA professionals responding to the survey, almost half of them said that they felt they did not receive adequate training. Um, among the FOIA requester community, uh, roughly 25% of them felt that the uh, FOIA professionals could use training and that that would help make the process uh, be more efficient. Um, so again, we have this almost mirror of the responses. Um, another item that I found interesting, um, but not surprising, is that uh, requesters, uh, uh, roughly 50% of them, were willing to narrow the scope of their request. And in my experience, I've found that to be true. Um, a lot of requesters are willing to narrow the scope of the request once they understand what the records are, are and the availability. Uh, and then another interesting point was over 90% of the requesters before they filed a FOIA request were doing research um, before they filed that request so that they could have a properly crafted um, FOIA request. So um, those, those were some interesting um, responses. The one that was the most interesting to me, I, I'll have to say, was among FOIA agency uh, professionals, the question was asked, if they had a magic wand to fix FOIA, what would they do? And the top response uh, was to fix internal processes, um, which I found very interesting. Um, and then the second, uh, the second largest response was allow more time to process cases, which a lot of us would like much more than 20 working days uh, to get to get a request out. Um, so those were just just to give you a highlight about some of the uh, responses. Um, so 
what I'd like to, to turn your attention to is uh, recommendation five. That would be the next slide, Kirsten, thank you. Um, it's a recommendation came out of the time volume committee and um, it's to recommend that OIP issue guidance to allow agencies, requesting agencies to have mandatory FOIA training for their employees. Um, and also an additional recommendation that OGIS and OIP undertake a study of the agency's current training requirements. Um, this, the committee came up with this, uh, with this recommendation based upon the responses from the survey, that both the FOIA agency uh, professionals and the requester community thought more training uh, would, be, would be helpful. Um, it's also interesting to note that under the FOIA, the chief FOIA officer is required um, to offer training to the agency staff. So while well, DOJ offers training and um, ASAP offers training, um, this is really to, ha to have really provide more training within the agency or, you know, to encourage folks to be able to attend the, the different DOJ trainings. Um, next slide, please, Kirsten. So this recommendation one um, was re is the committee recommends that OGIS undertake an assessment of the information that's made on the FOIA agency's website and for OGIS to also provide guidance on how agencies could improve their online description for the process. And again, this goes back to the survey where um, a lot of requesters are, were not familiar with the process. Um, and so the best way to address that is to have the best and the brightest websites that we can uh, really explain in the process clearly to the requester. Um, next slide, please, Kirsten. Okay, recommendation 13. Um, this recommendation is that agencies conduct a review of their staffing and their technology maybe every two years to identify the resources that they need to handle the FOIA request demands. Um, I, I really was um, so pleased when one of my colleagues made this recommendation. At the end of last, the fiscal year, uh, when I completed the FOIA annual report, I had started this process and I, I know I personally have found it helpful in managing workload and, and making recommendations regarding staffing needs and new technology needs. So um, I, I really like this recommendation. Uh, the next recommendation, uh, this recommendation is, uh, it's, the, the subcommittee recommends that OGIS and OIP have agencies identify um, certain records that are frequently requested by first party requesters and to implement a process to make these records accessible without requiring individuals to have to go through uh, the FOIA process. Um, it's kind of interesting because this recommendation and the next recommendation came out of a sub-subcommittee uh, where we were looking at what other countries were doing with their um, Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, we wanted to try and find ideas from other countries. Um, but what we came to stumble upon was um, uh, Professor Margaret Kolka had done a presentation for the 
Committee on First Person FOIAs. And through her research, she came to find that a good portion of FOIA requests are filed by first party requesters. And so we thought, wouldn't this be great if we could find a way where requesters are going to be able to get their own records without having to go through FOIA? And um, some agencies have some process. Uh, the uh, FBI uh, for criminal background checks, they, they have a process in place. Um, also, the Veterans Administration has a Veterans Benefit Management System where um, veterans and their legal counsel can use that to obtain the records. Um, so the next recommendation, uh, recommendation 15, this one uh, we're, we're recommending that agencies try and provide a way to um, allow uh, information uh, be provided to the public outside of FOIA, uh, including on in online databases, um, where the records basically go to the heart of the agency's mission. And um, two examples that we have for that is one is the Copyright Office has a public catalog of all the copyright registrations, and by having this this catalog available, it really has cut down on the number of FOIA requests that they need. Another example is for the U.S. from the U.S. Consumer Protection Safety Commission. They have a public database of uh, regarding the safety of consumer products. Again having that available has significantly decreased the number of FOIA requests that they've received. Um, the next recommendation is the committee uh, recommended that uh, OIP collect information through the Chief FOIA Officer Report regarding agency's standard operating procedures. And the thought behind this, again, was we, we look back to the survey where a lot of um, federal FOIA professionals felt that their, that their magic wand wish was to, to fix the FOIA, was to fix internal processes. And so by having a, a well-drafted standard operating procedure, that's going to, that's going to, and have processes in place, and it's going to cut down confusion and frustration. Um, but also, it's very, very helpful in training staff and training new employees. And um, so that's how we, we came up with this recommendation. So those are all of the um, time volume recommendations. Um, the next ones are come from the uh, Vision Subcommittee, um, which I was also a member of the Vision Subcommittee. And um, the Vision Subcommittee, uh, I'm a lawyer, so I'm not used to doing this, but um, they came up, we came up with a mission statement to, to set us on the right track for this subcommittee. Uh, and so I, I won't, read it all to you, but I, I will point out that our strategic plan was um, to raise the priority of FOIA within the executive branch, reconsider the model of OGIS within the FOIA community, increase accountability for transparency, manage expectations between agencies and the requester community, and stressing the need for increased and continued financial support. Um, that, that was, that's quite a visionary uh, mission statement. I mean, I'm really proud that we were really able to look into all of these measures, um, uh, and the majority of which we came up with recommendations for. So uh, the, the first recommendation, um, 
this is the, the, the committee recommends that OGIS and OIP together uh, help agencies in establishing briefings for senior leaders, especially during transitions or when you have new leadership in. And this would, this type of training, our thought would allow leadership to have an understanding of FOIA, the resources and the obligations, um, and, and also um, to educate leadership on the expectations of the FOIA process as well as records management. And, uh, you know, the goal here is to ensure that senior leadership understands their responsibilities. But by having DOJ and OIP create a training together, um, that's really going to assist agencies um, in educating their leadership. Because when you say this is a training from DOJ or and OGIS together, um, that is, I believe would speak volumes to leadership versus um, the FOIA officer trying to um, incur a training. Um, the next recommendation uh, for this one, the committee recommended that OGIS and OIP uh, examine the FOIA performance measures that are in the agency performance plans in order to encourage agencies um, to include FOIA in their performance plans. So the thought behind this is if you do have um, some FOIA metrics or FOIA performance measures in your agency performance plan, um, you, your leadership will be more invested um, and, and also have a better understanding um, and uh, of your FOIA process. And then the second part of this recommendation was after OGIS um, examine the, the measures uh, that they submit their, the results of their assessment and any recommendations that they have to Congress and the President. So um, the next two recommendations, again, are from the Vision Subcommittee, but these recommendations, instead of uh, directed towards agencies or to OGIS and OIP, they're for the Chief Way Officers Council. And the first one we have, uh, we propose to the Chief Way Officers Council that they recommend agency leadership annually issue a memorandum uh, reminding employees of their responsibility under the FOIA. And uh, I, I, can, I can tell you that I was at DOE and USDA when the secretary issued uh, such a memorandum and it was very powerful and it really, it really helped inform the employees of their, the importance of FOIA, the tight, tight deadline that we're under, and, and many of the offices um, were a little more understanding about the pressures we were under and were able to better work with us. Um, I've also, while well, been at um, NLRB, we've also issued a similar memo during Sunshine Week, which is a nice time of the year uh, to issue such a memo. So our thought here is that if the chief FOIA officer for each agency comes back to the agency and recommends this type of memo that, um, you know, that, that leadership would uh, be amenable to, to such a memorandum. And the next uh, recommendation that is directed to the Chief FOIA Officers Council is for the creation of a committee for cross-agency collaboration. And the goal for this committee would be to um, 
would be to research revenue resources for FOIA programs, also to promote initiatives for career uh, career trajectories for FOIA professionals, and then lastly to recommend models to align agency resources. And the goal of this recommendation coming from the Vision Subcommittee is to ensure that FOIA programs are well funded and it's a, it's a really, uh, it's such a creative recommendation and I know in the past uh, committee, the prior committee, a uh, similar recommendation was made for a um, technology uh, committee through the Chief FOIA Officers Council and that was uh, greatly successful. So I look forward to seeing what this um, committee comes up with. So next, uh, the Vision Committee came up with recommendations for Congress. And the first recommendation um, to Congress, the committee recommended that Congress engage more in oversight of the FOIA and the problems with implementing the FOIA and encourage Congress to hold more hearings and also to strengthen the office, uh, the, the Office of Government Information Services with more authority and expanded resources. So again, the goal of this recommendation was for there to be more government oversight of FOIA administration and the thought behind holding more hearings in Congress on FOIA was so that um, problems could be discussed and then we could identify solutions to these problems. And the other thought was strengthening OGIS and giving them more authority and more resources is in the short time of the creation of OGIS, uh, they've really been able, they've really had a huge impact in the FOIA community. And, you know, to be underfunded and underauthorized, it, it's hard, it's difficult for them to oversee FOIA across the government. And then the, the second recommendation that the committee had for Congress was to ask Congress to properly fund FOIA offices and ensure that agencies receive the resources that they need in order to do their job. Um, and again, the, the goal here for this recommendation is to ensure that FOIA programs are well funded. Um, you know, it's interesting to note that in the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016, um, agencies as well as OGIS had more duties and responsibilities under the FOIA. And it specifically said in that act that, uh, that yes, there's more tasks, but there's not no additional funding. Um, so I think this recommendation really tries to make up for that. Um, and. It, as you read the report, there's some ideas under this recommendation about what could be done. And one is that uh, Congress could require that the FOIA office um, be a budget line item for agencies, and that way Congress could directly appropriate FOIA funds. And those are the last of the um, uh, recommendations to Congress. So thank you, Patricia. So many sure. questions. Um, <laughs> I heard you. I heard you say OGES quite a lot, and yes. I just wanted to let let all the attendees know that we we at OGES have already started meeting to come up with a strategic 
plan for implementing these recommendations um, and mostly through forming partnerships with colleagues here at the National Archives, um, partnerships with the Office of Information Policy over at the Department of Justice, um, partnerships with the Chief FOIA Officers Council, which Alina um, chairs. So I just wanted to let folks know that um, we, we are, um, we're on it. Um, and I also wanted to let everyone know that we will be posting um, a stream of this meeting on our YouTube channel when it becomes available, um, when the stream becomes available. But um, Patricia, a question for you. Um, okay. The same one I asked Jason, of um, all of these recommendations that you've just been through, which one is your favorite and why? Um, okay, that's tough because I, I like them all. Um, but, uh, well, my absolute favorite one is the last one that I discussed, and that's um, about having Congress provide more money for the FOIA offices. Um, I, I think if we have more resources, we would better meet our our 20-day working deadlines. Uh, so I'm a huge fan of that one. But uh, another one that I, I absolutely love is the idea of agencies being able to look for records that first party requesters ask for and to try and, and find a, a different process for individuals to be able to get their own records instead of having to go through FOIA, which uh, oftentimes there's great delays and difficult for them to get their records in a timely manner. Okay, great, thank you. I have another question, and that is um, what ideas do you have for implementation of some of these recommendations for, um, for the typical FOIA officer at an agency yeah. somewhere in the government? Um, yeah, that's a, a great question. I, well, first of all, I think for training, um, I will say this, uh, I think you can do some great uh, in-house trainings with, with your FOIA team. Um, but also now uh, DOJ has a lot of their trainings available virtually um, online. I, I think for those of us in the D.C. area, we're a bit spoiled because we get we get to go to the OGIS and the DOJ training, and, and folks not in the DC area don't have that availability. But but now a lot of things I heard you all recently say that you're going to try and do your dispute resolution training online, and that I think that that right there you can knock off the training. Um, I will say this: we we had OGIS come to our agency and do a dispute resolution training specifically geared to our agency, and it was really helpful. Um, but the other um, thoughts that I had were for your FOIA website, I mean, that I think is, is an easy fix. I think if you can work with your OCIO team and um, use the DOJ guidance, DOJ came out with a guide 2.0 website guidance, I believe 2.0, which is really helpful as well as guidance that they have in their um, uh, assessment toolkit. I, I think it provides a lot of help. Uh, and these are things that um, hopefully with the website wouldn't cost you too much money. Um, but the other thoughts, that, things that, that folks can do that, that doesn't cost them any money um, is, is doing the assessment of staff and technology to identify your resources um, for your future FOIA demands. I mean, that, that can be done by the FOIA officer and uh, his or her staff. Uh, another item that doesn't cost any money 
would be to work with leadership or your chief FOIA officer to include FOIA performance measures in in the agency performance plan. Um, again, that doesn't doesn't cost anything. And another no cost item is any of the the memo on the importance of FOIA. You know, having the secretary or the agency head send that out. And, and even if you do it in, in, as an annual item, maybe every, you know, during Sunshine Week in March would be great. And this was a recommendation that was put out by OGIS, I believe back in 2012, 2013, and, um, and I, I believe NARA uh, started it. Um, so th those are some no cost items that, you can really implement now, and you can you can take the the report and you know give this to your leadership, and I think it will help help you be able to implement some of these items. Okay, that's great. I love the emphasis on um, no cost, um, yeah. at least in terms of financial resources. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody. So, nobody and <laughs> No one has to give money. Uh, you know, it's always hard when you say it's going to cost X, but when it's free, it's it's you know, it's almost a no-brainer. Right, right. So I am going to turn this back over to Jason to talk about um, some future, um, re two future recommendations. But before I do, Jason, do you have any questions for Patricia about? what she has just gone over. I think Patricia's done a great job. Uh, the, uh, I think uh, Patricia and I talked about um, how these, how the next FOIA advisory committee can help with implementing some of these recommendations. And so, uh, Patricia, do you think that uh, that uh, the FOIA Advisory Committee can play a role in helping agencies to get, to make progress? Well, that, that was, that was a recommendation or a suggestion that was put into the, the committee's final report. And I, and that was one of your, your suggestions, Jason, and I, I love that suggestion. I mean, it's, it's great for the committee to come up with all these recommendations, um, but, you know, a recommendation is great, it, but, but you, it need, you need some help to get them implemented. And so I, I love the suggestion to have uh, this next uh, FOIA advisory committee assist with the implementation of these. I hope it does. I, I do too, I do too. So Jason, over to you for the um, past, present, and future. Right, so we had a, a section of the report that, that looking to the future and uh, the uh, archivist uh, David Ferriero has been looking to the future for some time. Back 2012, he spearheaded a, a managing government records directive that really changed the course of how email uh, went from print to paper to an electronic process after 2016, uh, electronic management, and set a, a deadline at the end of the decade for making further progress towards electronic government. And then more recently, um, Mr. Ferriero and OMB uh, issued M1921, and uh, that uh, memo transitioned to electronic records, which is cited several times in the final report, is uh, talking about the future, talking about how uh, we get to you know, 2022 and going digital both at NARA as well as managing electronic records in government. What this recommendation um, uh, purports to do is to uh, ask the archivist to um, continue in taking a leadership role, uh, particularly on what is increasingly thought of as data strategies um, 
so that they incorporate FOIA access and federal record keeping. This uh, dovetails with the earlier recommendation about a CDO officer um, and officers uh, reporting to the CDO council. It is pretty clear to a number of us that um, where the hockey puck is going um, over the next decade, and, and that is um, increased uh, tension and emphasis to data and data strategies and a life cycle of data. It is enormously important that the frameworks of FOIA that have been with us since 1966 and the Federal Records Act, which goes back you know, to 1950 in its current major form and even before that, get incorporated in notions of that, get incorporated in conversations about data strategy going forward. And so one would like to see uh, references to FOIA and the Federal Records Act in various OMB memos and whatever products are coming out. And I think the archivist could continue to play uh, a really visionary and a strategic role in that. And so that's one of our look to the future recommendations. Uh, next slide. So the last recommendation, um, 22, uh, in the final report is really looking to the future. And what we're saying is that the archivist should work with other governmental components and industry in kind of a R&D, research into AI, into artificial intelligence, into machine learning to improve FOIA and to improve uh, searches through electronic record repositories. Wouldn't it be nice uh, to the FOIA community if a, through an algorithm, through machine learning, uh, could make your job easier by identifying those records in a greater collection that are, that may have sensitivities to them, that may have exempt material that is subject to withholding, um, either in whole or in part. This is a an aspirational goal, but I think it's within the capability of current machine learning technologies. And I think there's, um, if we can harness various uh, components of government uh, that already are involved in uh, a large variety of AI activities under an executive order that's been issued in this administration and just generally because they're, they see what the future is, um, if we can point of practical applications to record keeping, auto classification, and FOIA in terms of filtering content that would add search. Um, that would all be great. And so uh, we wrote this in as, uh, as something that uh, pointing to the work um, that's clearly going to come uh, over uh, the next few years. Great, thank you, Jason. So that is that is all of the um, all of the recommendations, and we want to turn it over to Q and A. Um, but before we do, I have one last question for both of you, and that is, can you talk a little bit about how your experience has been serving on this term's FOIA advisory committee? Um, well. Uh, for me, um, it was really it was really an honor to be on this committee, and I, I have to say, it was one of the highlights of my career. Um, I, on this committee, I served with other federal government uh, federal government FOIA professionals. We had some historians and professors, um, representatives from Muttbrock and Pogo, and uh, Tom Sussman and, and Jason were huge resources for us, and um, I learned so much. Um, uh, it never would dawn on me to come up with a mission statement, and uh, and what a beautiful thing that was. And many of my colleagues came up with recommendations that, that never occurred to me, and they were fantastic ideas. What I do love is that everyone on the committee uh, was very passionate, um, but we were united in a common goal. And it was also interesting to me that um, uh, federal agency folks and requester community folks, they had empathy for, for the other. 
um, you know, they understood uh, each other's struggles. And at the end of the day, you know, we we're, we're really are there for a common goal. I mean, requesters want their records in a timely manner, and agencies want to provide these records in a timely manner. So to be able to work with this group and um, try and find some, some real positive solutions uh, was just a wonderful experience. So I, I'm grateful that I had the opportunity. Thank you. Jason, how was your experience? So I, I think I've already said that I loved working at the National Archives and it was a great joy to be able to uh, come back into um, an environment where I'm working with um, all of you and OGIS, Alita and Kirsten and Jesse and others, um, and Martha, and, uh, and then working with other uh, federal um, officials as part of the uh, advisory group. I, I, I came in um, with some degree of skepticism as to how much we could accomplish. I think the, um, the surprising thing to me and uh, something that was, uh, was uh, terrific was that um, the, the group that comprised the third term um, came up with 22 recommendations that if implemented uh, could really make progress in this area. They're not small bore, they are thinking about um, ways that systemically um, uh, we can improve FOIA throughout uh, the government. And so I'm very happy with the efforts uh, that um, across the board that have been made. And um, I found the time to be uh, very interesting and uh, I look forward to uh, watching the work uh, of Alita chairing the next term. Great, well thank you, Jason. Um, I'm now going to open it up for questions. Um, Jesse, I don't know that we've gotten any via chat, but I just wanted to let all participants know that if you have a question, you can please uh, chat it to us in the chat box, or our event producer will also um, go to the, open the phone lines. Absolutely, ladies and gentlemen. So as a reminder, to submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and send. Alternatively, pressing pound two on your telephone keypad will enter you into the question queue. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted, and at that time, state your question. Once again, pressing pound two will enter you into the verbal question queue. Alina? Yes. While we are waiting. Did, yes, did you have any questions for Jason and Patricia? No, um, I think they both did an excellent job of presenting uh, these different recommendations. I, I'm not sure if you pointed this out earlier, Kirsten, but we had the privilege of working with Jason and Patricia along with Avi Moshine and Sean Moulton from Pogo um, on uh, drafting the final report. and. One of the reasons that I thought um, Jason and Patricia would be ideal in presenting these is not only were they um, great participants in the process and, and very informed participants, but knowing all the nitty gritty details of the final report and making sure all the I's were dotted, all the T's were crossed, um, they definitely put a lot of labor into that process. And I, for that, I am very thankful. I know Patricia and you are too. Yes, indeed. Um, and just one thing, Jason mentioned um, Jesse Kratz, who is the National Archives historian. Um, we were lucky to have her detailed to um, OGIS for um, the past several months to help with, with um, advisory committee duties, and that's been, been uh, very helpful. So any questions? All oh, right, I currently see no questions in the um, question queue for the telephone. Okay. 
Okay, so we've got a shy audience today. I'm actually going to ask a question if I could. Um, going back to the very beginning of this discussion, Jason, you mentioned um, the silos and, and you mentioned the Federal Records Act and the Freedom of Information Act and how they define records differently. Can you discuss that at all? Well, um, those definitions are not exactly the same. Uh, for one thing, the two statutes have a slightly different scope. Uh, FOIA covers the executive branch and not the legislative or judicial branches, whereas the Federal Records Act covers not only the executive branch, but portions of the legislative and judicial branch. So what is defined as a federal record is a little broader. But the definition itself, uh, agency records, um, uh, excluded from that are, are personal records. Um, the, under the Federal Records Act, there are different, a different way of thinking about it. There's federal records, there are non-records, and then there are personal records. And so um, there's that. Um, in my view, <clears throat> the, they're very, very close. And it is unfortunate uh, that <clears throat> they're dealt with in agencies by usually by different people and different processes without 100% knowledge. For example, let's just pick one of my favorite topics, capstone. So capstone is a policy that's a voluntary policy that agencies have adopted for email. And um, the question I would have to the FOIA office, uh, the FOIA officers uh, on uh, watching this is uh, to what extent are you aware of uh, what your agency is doing with respect to capstone policies and to what extent you're incorporating thinking about searching against capstone repositories for FOIA requests? Um, the records officers know all about it, uh, or they should. Your agency has implemented. FOIA officers may or may not uh, know, and, uh, and that's come out in various surveys and, and reports. So that's one. Uh, uh, area that you can see that there's a divergence in terms of the cultures and uh, thinking about. But um, I, everything that we've talked about in this webinar is, is really trying to uh, bring closer together those communities by incorporating um, some elements of records management into FOIA uh, in terms of the training and otherwise. Um, and so there you have it. Okay, great. Thank you. It sounds like an area worthy of um, a further look. So I don't see any questions in the chat box, Alina. And Michelle, do we have any on the phone? There are currently no questions in the queue. Okay, super. Well, I will turn it back over to Alina then. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Patricia. Um, a round of virtual applause for both of you. Um, I, I wish we were in McGowan Theater at the National Archives doing this in person, but uh, alas, we are not. But thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Kristen, do you want to advance to the next slide? Great. Public comments? Yes. So, I have a bad. Uh, that's it. That's slide. So, okay. That is the next slide, yes. Uh, so uh, at this time, uh, as we always do in our public meetings, we leave time at the end for anyone who would like to offer any public comments. Uh, I will say that we have received one um, fairly lengthy comment from um, uh, member of the requester community. We are going to post it online unless we have already done that. Please check our website, uh, click on the annual um, meeting link and uh, click on this year's annual report and you'll be able to see it there. Uh, at this time, I want to open up uh, the phone and in the chat to anyone who wants to make any comments. Um, if you could state your name and affiliation, that would be great. Uh, so please, Let's go ahead, and, and Michelle, can you just remind everyone one more time 
how they can chime in by phone. Absolutely. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, to be able to uh, make a comment or ask a question over the phone, please press pound two on your telephone keypad. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your comment or question. Once again, pressing pound two will enter you into the question queue. Okay, thanks. So I'm gonna ask our, um, Kirsten, do you see any chat comments or questions in our chat box? I don't see any. Again, I think we have a shy audience today. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I think um, we do have a shy audience. I don't see okay. any. Um, maybe we scheduled this for Monday morning and that was a mistake because people are still <laughs> clearing the cobwebs from the weekend. So next time we'll do it in the middle of the week. Uh, again, uh, any comments that we received today or even after this meeting? Uh, if anyone has the uh, opportunity to watch this, hopefully it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel uh, at a later point. Anyone to submit any comments, um, please submit them to OGISOpenMeeting at nara.gov. Um, so not having heard anything else, um, Kirsten, you want to flip over to the next slide? That is the last slide, Alina. Okay, where we say, Uncle Sam wants your ideas. Yes. Right, so uh, again, we invite everyone to visit OGIS's website and social media for more information about all of our activities and how you can participate. Um, at this point, unless Jason or Patricia or Kirsten have any parting words, I'm gonna pause for a moment. Any parting words? I have none. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jason may be quiet for once, which is very characteristic. Jason, any parting words? Uh, no, thanks. Thanks very much, Lynn. Oh, all right. Thank you. And thanks to Kirsten, who did a wonderful job moderating. Um, I want to thank everyone again for joining us. I hope everyone and their families remain safe, healthy, and resilient. And we will see you again for our kickoff meeting of the Floyd Advisory Committee on September 10th, which I predict will likely be virtual. So thanks yeah. everyone. Have a great uh, rest of your week. Take care. Thanks, thanks, thanks Alina, Kirsten, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.